Got my brother Henry Aikens in the house. Hicks and Gracie Black Belt, OG. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading your bio got before you got here. Okay. That you're from Oklahoma. Yep. That was the that was the start of it. Um, growing up with wrestlers, you know? And uh, back then, the wrestlers, I mean, they're still, right? Like, so tough and so hard to deal with. And uh, I just, that was really what opened my eyes to grappling being such an effective form of combat. Wrestlers were always the toughest, like every year, you know, from the time I was like a, a freshman in high school, it was, there was always like the senior that year mm. wrestler was the toughest dude in the high school. And then the next year, you know, that, that group graduated the next year, there was another wrestler that was the toughest dude in the high school that nobody messed with. And, you know, so yeah, I was just like, man, wrestling, huh? Well, I got to figure out something that'll beat wrestling. And then, uh, you know, I stumbled across jujitsu. Did you, like, did you wrestle? I didn't. Um, and, and I, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, part of me wishes I did. And then the other part of me is glad that I didn't wrestle. Um, and, and the reason is, is just because I think training style, um, and, and you've probably experienced this as a teacher, when you have a new student that comes in from a wrestling background, how physical and how hard they go, you know, it's very, I think American wrestling is very, very intense and very physical and in jujitsu as teachers we're always trying to get people to relax and be more efficient and 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 try to go with the flow and not so much impose your will against the person but to try to use their the person's energy against them right and like let them do what they want to do let them move let them do things but count you're constantly countering countering and, and adapting and so um the the wrestling style that i feel most closely resembles that is the the Eastern European style of wrestling. You know, um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, Vladdy, Vladimir Matyushenko, right, right. you know, coaching at my gym. Yeah, yeah and uh, man, his wrestling is so insane. It's so, it feels like jujitsu. You know, when you touch with, he, you'll push him and he just goes with it, you know, and he's so fluid, mm -hmm. so smooth, and it's constantly just off balancing you. And that to me is, is, you know, beautiful, right? And that's, I think the beauty of jiu-jitsu is not so much like forcing things to happen, but allowing things to happen and just taking advantage of every situation. Yeah. Yeah, I think like for me, like I'm like, I'm glad I found jiu-jitsu because if I may would have done wrestling, I would have been like a wrestler first and then taking it with that wrestler's mindset. Yeah. But I'm grateful that I'm like, I feel like I'm all jiu-jitsu. And then of course I add, re you add wrestling and all the different right. aspects, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, I, that's, for me, you know, my mindset is like, I'm, I'm glad I found and, and studied and put time and energy into jiu-jitsu first. Um, and it's not that I really, I, I did play with some wrestling, but Hickson was always very big on takedowns, on uh, self-defense, on base. So if you watch his seminars, you watch him go teach, you know, he always starts from the feet. And he always starts off usually with um, teaching some self-defense stuff, some stand-up stuff. A lot of the focus from the feet with him is just how to have proper base, how mm -hmm. to have balance, how not to let someone push you around or not to let someone be able to dictate your movement, mm -hmm. you know, um, how to shift your balance so that you're always in balance. And so um, that was always a huge part of our training. And uh, so it was super, super helpful. I always tell people, I, ne I never really needed to do wrestling or judo. I love learning other martial arts and I love just learning but um i never spent a huge amount of time doing that because we spent a ton of time on the feet already and playing with you know what i considered was just jujitsu that's all part of jujitsu mm. yeah i agree so you were in oklahoma city is that what, what uh, well i was just north oklahoma city okay. so i lived in oklahoma city um but we were living in an area uh, in north oklahoma city that so that we can go to a school district that was like a better school district because Oklahoma City didn't have really, okay. <laughs> really good schools where I was. Uh, and so we, I was going to a school in a town called Edmond, Edmond which I've was a, that, yeah. like a massive uh, wrestling. We, we were just monsters, like uh, just sports. High school sports in general is huge. The, the year I graduated, I think um, we were considered like a 5A school, which at mm -hmm. the time was the biggest school. There was a thousand people in my graduating class and we won five state championships in you know sports 
So it was just a, a monster powerhouse for for sports. And when did you first start watching like UFC or C Hickson or any of the great? So yeah, my senior year. My senior year, uh, I was doing martial arts already, uh, but stand up stuff, mostly stand up stuff, and. Um, saw old grainy VHS tape of Gracie in action. This is before even the UFC came out, right? And I'm like, whoa, like these guys, you know, so when you watch Gracie in action and you have Horian, you know, you have that scene with the lions taking down the zebra and you're just like getting fired up and your heart's racing, you know? Mm -hmm. And in Oklahoma, I mean, people like to fight anyways, you know, that people are drinking and fighting all the time. So you watch these guys and they're doing challenge matches all the time and we're just like holy crap like look at the and you see everyone just getting spanked right like we're invite you in <laughs> hey we're gonna put the small <laughs> guy the days, to, yeah. you know <laughs> look we're gonna put my student against you he's just like a blue belt or and back then you know blue belts were like yeah blue belts were like you know Gods, black belts yeah. in any other martial yeah. art right and they were just sm smashing everybody and schooling everyone and then of course the hicks and zulu fight and um so that was just like okay i found it i always wanted to find that was the thing, you know, it, growing up in Oklahoma, I realized how effective grappling was as a form of self-defense or as a combat sport. Um, and I wanted it to be more of a martial art. I wanted to be, instead of just a sport, understand more about the fighting aspect, right? Um, and also at the time, I, I just was just being from Asian, growing up in an Asian household, you know, the ideas of like respect and honor and all those things were important to me. So that's why I kind of gravitated towards martial arts. Um, Did your parents do no. martial arts? My dad, so my stepdad is Thai and he uh, did a little Thai boxing in school. So, you know, he showed me some of that and, um, you know, so I, I, I saw a little bit of Thai boxing. I was aware of, of, of Muay Thai, um, but I was doing Taekwondo just because, you know, back then, after after what happened after Karate Kid, right? Karate blew up in the United right, States. Right, Everyone right. started doing karate, and then right. Taekwondo was pretty similar to karate. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, that's a cool martial art. And there's Taekwondo and karate schools on every corner. So I just found something close. Yeah. And back then you don't know, right? We they they didn't have the UFC, so it wasn't like let's put all these martial arts against each other and see which one's the best. It's like, oh wow, you you hear about it, you see Chuck Norris on TV. And you see him kicking everybody's butt. And then you see Bruce Lee on TV. Mm. And then you see, like, Jean-Claude Van Damme, mm. right? And then you're like, okay, that that must be the deal, right? I'm going to I'm gonna learn that. I'm going to mm. learn how so to punch and kick. you see Royce Gracie. <laughs> well, until, <laughs> right. until so in, in, in high school, this was a huge thing for me, is uh, we had a guy that went to our school who um, was on the Olympic team for Taekwondo. Uh, there's a big, uh, there's a big, um, training center, Taekwondo training center, massive Taekwondo training center there in Edmond, Oklahoma. Um, the last name was Poos. And he, him and another wrestler, um, who was a buddy of mine, had some beef. They end up getting in a fight. Of course, the wrestler took him down, beat him up. Uh, it didn't end there. You know, th let's do it again. They got in another fight like a couple weeks later. So, the Taekwondo guy kept getting beat up by the wrestler to the point where the dad had to come into school and they had to like talk to the principal and like, Hey, he's got to leave my kid alone, you know? Mm -hmm. So that to me was already huge. That was an epiphany like, wow. Okay. So you have a guy who's on the Olympic team, um, in Taekwondo, which, you know, I mean, it's so different now when things become a sport, right? right. It's all about point fighting. Um, but still you're a crazy level. Yeah. Be, you're a crazy high it. level and you have a high school, and I mean, I mean, you know, my buddy, he, he did get a scholarship to go to uh, Oklahoma University to wrestle, but um, he was just getting destroyed, you know. It wasn't even a, it didn't, it, have a it didn't even, it didn't yeah. even, yeah, it didn't even, it would like be throw, throw a kick and then you'd be on your back and then be getting punched, you know, on top. So I, I realized how um, effective grappling was as, as a combat sport. And uh, I just wanted to wanted to learn it. I wanted to find something that could beat wrestling because at th back then it was just like, okay, what can I learn to beat my friends up? Mm. Right. Um, and then I saw Gracie in action and then Gracie in action. As soon as I saw it, I was like, that's it. I found it. How did you find it? So, uh, a friend 
of a friend had an old grainy VHS tape that was, you know, like you, a dub of a dub of a dub where you have like those lines going through and it's like, that's how it was. Yeah. Like lines and the lines would float up the screen and, but it was, it was good enough that you can hear the audio and that you could see kind of the picture. Right. Um, and we must've watched Gracie in action. We must've watched it like 30 or 40 times, you know, right when we got it and then we copied it ourselves. Right. So, um, that was you it. Had, you had jiu-jitsu, Gracie Jiu Jitsu versus stand up. You had Gracie Jiu Jitsu versus wrestler wrestling. Yeah, they you had, were. You had every, everything covered. Just fighting everyone, right? Um, and, and it was, it was cool because back then too, um, you saw a lot of these matches. You know, they showed the old matches in Brazil where it was Valle Tudo, hmm. which is, you know, they say UFC is as close to uh, fighting as it gets, but Valle Tudo is really as close to fighting as it gets anything because anything goes. Yeah. Back then, they were head stomping, they were head butting, they were uh, elbowing everywhere. Like in Pride, you're not allowed to elbow to the face, right? So they've, they've elbowed to the all back of the head. Rules. Yeah, you could, you know, I mean, there was just no biting and no eye gouging, right? So they they took they take it even a step further than and, and no time limit, no weight divisions, mm. right? So that adds another level, and so that's like okay that's as close as it gets and these guys are fighting dudes way bigger than them and you know anything can happen these guys are headbutting each other and they're they're beating everyone up so um i was like okay i got to learn that's what i got to learn and then the ufc came out right uh the first ufc was 1993 mm. um and immediately you know you see the roster and i was already like okay this guy's going to win this hoist Gracie guy's going to win. Of course he won the first one in under five minutes, right? Three dudes in one night in mm. under five minutes. So that was really, really, I mean, still impressive today, right? Yeah. And who, who fights three times in one night in a, a no know, time limit, no weight. Valid judo, any, any headbutts. Yeah. No weight, no right. time limit. So, um, after that, we saw, saw that, um, so in 94, uh, I went out to LA mm. on, um, I think it was like, it was around Thanksgiving time. So we, we had a break, we had a, a little bit of a break and it was around Thanksgiving time, went out to LA to try to find Hicks in school to train with him. Right. Because like by, after that, after the, after the UFC, um, and after watching Gracie in action, they mentioned in Gracie in action that Hickson's the best, the champion of the family. Mm. But then after the UFC, Hoist is on the cover of Black, I think it was like Black Belt Magazine or one of the martial arts magazine. He goes, oh, you think I'm good? You should see my brother Hickson. He's mm -hmm. 10 times better than me. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, I want to train with that guy, right? Like, let's see why this guy's so good. So um, I, I went out to find him and it was a little bit of a struggle finding him. Uh, but we had a friend of a friend whose personal trainer um, trained at Hickson school. So we got the, we got the address back then. It was the days before the internet, before right? There's Google, no Google yeah. search, right? You, you're like yellow looking pages, at the yellow pages. And they didn't have a yellow page listing. There's no, there's they didn't no. buy the full page ad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no the business. They didn't even have a listing. Oh my gosh. To, to find the school. Oh my. If you, if you've seen choke, you, you, you've, you've seen the school that where, where they were training, it was literally down this back alleyway. You had to go down this back alleyway. There was a painted sign like, a painted sign like this big that said Hicks and Gracie Jiu Jitsu on the front that was painted on a piece of wood. And uh, it was down this back alleyway inside a karate school, right? Inside was, of a karate school, yeah, not even by itself. Dingy and it was, it was, it was pretty gross. Like thinking back, you know, no, if people would not want to go in there and train nowadays, cause you're just like, oh gosh, this is like, you're going to get ringworm and staff and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I went in there and I was just like, oh, so the first time I walk in there, right, I'm on, I'm on spring break and I came out with a buddy of mine and we were like, okay, we're, we're going to go train. We're going to start, try to learn this stuff, right? See how much we can learn in a week. Um, walk in there and we're like, is this the right place? We see guys wrestling around and the first, within the first like three minutes, I, we walk up to the railing, um, cause it was like on an elevated floor, like a wooden floor, like they had, cause it was a karate school. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're watching these guys training. And within three minutes, I see a guy get put to sleep. And then another guy's like lifting his legs up, trying to like get blood flow back into his brain. You know, that was your first class. That was that I wasn't even taking the class. Oh, I just came in to watch, watch. and I see a dude unconscious on the ground. And I look at my buddy. I'm like, 
we're in the right place. <laughs> like, this, this is the right You're place. You're like, nah, this is what we maybe we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be here. You're like, nah, this is the right place. I'm like, this is, what, this is why we're here. You know, <laughs> learn some superpowers. So, yeah, so I trained for a week. And then um, after that week of uh, literally just getting demolished, right, just getting... I mean, I was, I was already humble. I, I, I was excited to be getting smashed and thrashed, but, um, I was completely blown away by how effortless they made it. That was, that was really the first experience is like, God, this guy is not even trying and he's just smoking me. And I was a tough kid. Like I, you know, I'd gotten in my, my, uh, my share of fist fights and, um, I was working out a lot, you know, I was freaking strong. I was super strong back then. I was just at the gym all the time. And that's what we thought would be tough was let's right, just get super right, strong. Right. And then we're going to, you know, um, do a little bit of martial arts, do some kicking and punching. And, you know, I thought that's, that, that's the, that's the recipe. Right. And, uh, man, it, it was, I was just, even, even wrestling around with my wrestler buddies, they'd mm. kick my butt, but I could put up a, I could put up a little bit of a fight, but, um, yeah, I was training with some, uh, purple belt at the time and uh, got smoked blue belt at the time, all guys that were smaller and much weaker than me, you know, physically not as strong as me. And I was just getting smoked. And I was just like, after that week, I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to, to do this. You know, I gotta figure out a way to, to make this happen. And so, um, went back, graduated, uh, finished out the year of school and then moved out to LA to train with Hickson that summer. So you graduated from high school or no, uh, I was in college. I was in my okay, first okay. year of college. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. And moved out to LA. Yeah. I moved out to LA. So I was, uh, yeah, I started in June of 95. So it was like November of 94 when I went. Um, and then I think that it was during December that Hickson, um, had done the second Valley Tudo. Mm. And that's where they, f that's how they, f they filmed choke. I think so it was the first one or the, yeah, it was the second one. So that was when they were filming, they were filming. So choke. while, you, while you were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they were filmed. So, uh, so yeah, those are, those so it was early days. Yeah. Early days. So I started training in 95 and, um, literally I moved out from Oklahoma. I packed up, you know, as much as I could in my car, moved out, didn't know anyone, which was a, a, a blessing in disguise because mm. I had no distractions. Um, and I basically just, where'd you, where'd you stay? Moved into the gym. Uh, I was living, I found a room for rent, uh, at an old lady's house in El Segundo. So I, I didn't had know, you, I didn't know anyone. Google, I didn't so. know. Yeah. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anyone. My mom had a friend who had a friend and she's like, Oh, you know, I have a friend and her friend, you know, she's got a room. All the kids have moved out of the house and she's, she was like an older lady okay. and she'll, she rents you this room for 400 bucks a month. Okay. Right. And so I had money saved up a little bit of money saved up and I figured, okay, I'll move out. Let me, I have enough money to just train for, and I was super frugal, um, at the time still, but, uh, you know, I had a monthly budget of about 800 bucks a month. So 400 went to rent and then the other 400 went to gas and paying my car and, you know, groceries. My, my, I always tell people my, my weekly grocery budget was 40 bucks a week mm. for groceries. That was my food for the week. And I would go to this, uh, supermarket called food for less. I don't know if you've seen them. There's, yeah. they, it's in Hawthorne. Okay. They have it in okay. Hawthorne and they have them kind of in, Inglewood. And, um, you know, I would, I would go and buy my food for the week. And I had like, you know, two Budgeted. boxes of cereal, a bag of, you know, five, five apples, five oranges, a thing of bananas, a loaf of bread, a big thing of salad. So yeah, I was, uh, basically just training. My, my whole focus was just to train. And what happened was after the first, um, the first probably month and a half, because I was literally showing up at the school at seven in the morning and not leaving till seven mm. o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night. Um, they just offered me a job. Kim offered me a job. She said, Hey, you know, you're here all the time. Anyways, do you just want to be the secretary? Do you want to answer the phones? Cause they didn't have anyone doing that mm. at the time. Might as so well I was like, yeah. work, right? Yeah. Might as well. So clean the mats, come, you know, show up in the morning. We had these, uh, green fold out mats. So every morning we'd have to go lay out the fold out mats 
all the way down and the fold out mats were just, I mean, they were just like, you know, they've been rolled on so much that they were just like paper thin. Um, but those were the mats that Hickson fought, uh, Yoji Anjo mm. on that famous story. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Cause I, I'm like, I moved to Brazil. Uh, when, when did I go down the first time? I think, uh, 96 beginning of 96, you know, but it was an interesting time when I watched that, uh, born a champion, the Patrick Finery movie, right? Yeah. You know, it just kind of captures like those, those times, you know, he did such an awesome job with that movie. Uh, I messaged him, you know, um, he sent me before, before the movie came out, he goes, Hey, uh, you know, I did this movie. I want to send it to you. Let me know what you think. And I, after I saw it, there were so many like iconic moments in the film, like sure dog. And it just brought back so many memories. It was, there was so much nostalgia in the film. Yeah. I was just like, wow, man. You like know, him telling you he's gonna he's gonna what he's gonna do he yep. shuts it locks the door <laughs> this is what i'm gonna do to you and then i'm gonna do it again and then i'm gonna do it again and you're like oh shit <laughs> it was like that's nostalgia that i mean and it's it's so true to life too because that stuff happened right all the stuff in the film sean took from personal experience and things that actually happened during those those times so it was kind of cool for him to to put so many like cool historical things in the film. It was yeah. really kind of the wild, wild west of martial arts during those years because jujitsu was still trying to prove itself, right? You had Hoist win the first UFC, then he won the second UFC, and then the third one right. he had to pull out. But at the time, there were still challenge matches going on, and, and there were still people. I mean, even nowadays, there's still people that, you know, from time to time, they're just doing these crazy martial arts and you're just like, have you guys not been watching TV or paying attention? Like <laughs> you realize that stuff's not effective. Right. Um, so yeah, even nowadays people, you know, there's still, I think a huge portion of people that just are not really aware of what is practical and effective in, in real fighting. When I, when I was living in Brazil, there were some moments where I'm like, man, what am I doing here? You know, because like speaking of the wild, wild west, nobody knew what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was. You know, like, what am I? It you wasn't, know, I, you know, I was called I Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Right. It's just Jiu Jitsu, right? Right, right. But in like, Brazil. in Brazil, yeah. But like, just the fact, you know, what am I doing with my life that I'm in Brazil, like, training with a bunch of just, you know, nasty, you know, like, sweaty, like, just, you know, people's legs around each other's faces and necks, you know, like, what am I, what am I doing, you know? Yeah. What am I, you know, I was following my heart, obviously, but were there any, were there any moments like that for you? I, Man, I had so many moments like that, you know, because like my mom, my family, like, what are you doing with well, your life? Oh yeah. I had a lot of that. I had a lot of pushback from my family because just growing up in an Asian household, you know, my parents are very, very into education, very mm. into academics. Um, their plan for me was to be either a doctor or an engineer or, mm. uh, an attorney, something to kind of bring honor to the family and have a good, respectable job. And, um, you know, I, my, I have a fa crazy story about my family. They all came over after the Vietnam war. Mm. Um, all my aunts and uncles were, you know, in their thirties, didn't speak any English at all. And every single one of my aunts and uncles, uh, except my mom and one of her sisters they either became a doctor or an engineer. And so, you know, they were really about academics. And so when I moved to LA and dropped out of school this. and just start wanting to do jiu-jitsu, you know, that came up all the time. Like, what am I going to do, man? Am I, am I going to be able to make a living? Um, what's your eth 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 ethnicity, Vietnamese, Vietnamese and, and, and my dad's, my dad's like a uh, European mixture. Okay. Yeah. He's got a little bit of a native American Indian okay. in him, but yeah, I'm basically half Vietnamese and mm -hmm. half kind of like mutt, you know? And they came after here. They came here after like Vietnam war. Yeah. After much. the Vietnam war, they all came over. Uh, in 75, I was actually born in Vietnam. So my mom went back to Vietnam, uh, in 75, she was pregnant with me hmm. and that's how, I, um, it's a crazy story how I was born. Uh, she went back to get her family out. And at the, the time, like the boat, the boat people. Yeah. Well, there were, there, there were, people were leaving. A lot of people were leaving by boat because, um, I was able to get on a plane because my mom was already married to my dad at the time, obviously. Um, he's an American citizen. And so just by birthright, I'm, I'm an American citizen. My dad had told my mom, don't go back to Vietnam. Things are starting to really get bad in the country. Like it, it looks like they're going to pull out, uh, and the communists are going to take over. So he told her not to go back. She went back anyways to, to try to get the family out. Um, while she went back, she had me now 
during that time, they didn't have uh, any anesthesia left in the hospital. She had to have me by C-section. Mm. So uh, the doctor put rope in her mouth, and she bit down, and they had some nurses hold her arms apart and cut her open without any anesthesia. So pretty crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it chokes me up when I talk about it because I'm like, man, fuck. It, it's kind of crazy that my what my mom went through to um, be able to have me. You know, like she she was could have died, right? She was ready to die to have me. So, um, yeah. So that that was the story of how I was born, and then you know, uh, from Vietnam we went to Thailand, and then from Thailand to the U.S. Through Thailand. Yeah. And so they let the, they let me in, and then my dad ended up forging papers and just to try to help get family members out and mm. stuff like that because he's an American. He's like, oh yeah, these people are my family. These, and so not only did he help my um, our immediate family get out, but also a lot of other people. You know, he helped get out. So, wow, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. What a crazy story. Yeah, my dad, my dad, you know, fought in the Vietnam War and stuff, and some crazy, crazy stories. You know. Yeah, the the war was crazy. I mean, you go back and look at the history of what happened there and, and the atrocities that were, I mean, it's just, it, it's crazy. You know, it's it's a, I understand why people coming back from the war had such a hard time coping. You know, we had so many uh, veterans coming back and that were just, after yeah. seeing what went on there and what happened over there it, it's hard to come back and, and live a normal life he was a, he was a smart guy uh, he was in college and stuff he, did, he volunteered you know he yeah. became like a green beret he got spit on when he got back you know he's yeah and he had a tough childhood too you know he was like adopted mm -hmm. and you know and just had a crazy childhood so yeah it's crazy crazy times you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then just hearing you know he, he would tell me stories and just you know because he would he, their jobs are to train like you know like the, the, like the vietnam and that was during the fight the, you know during the draft and so you know they were you didn't have a choice a lot of times right right you're gonna go over there right. right and so you were getting drafted over there and they were sending kids i mean 18 19 20 yeah. year old you don't yeah. know anything i mean i can't imagine being 20 years old with a machine gun and being told you got to go out and kill these people mm. that you don't know. Crazy. It's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. He, he was like smart. He didn't believe in the war, but he really appreciated and loved the country just because of the, his background. Yeah. And so he, you know, he didn't feel that it was right for young kids like that to be fighting over there where he could be living his life well, you know, in college and stuff. So he felt that like it was his duty, you know, that's yeah. why he told me he went. Wow, that's awesome. But, uh, but yeah, he's just, you know, crazy stories, crazy stuff, you know. And then I've had some friends that their families, like the, the was it the boat, the boat people, mm -hmm. they, they all, because of the, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnam, they, they moved in, right? Yep. And all the people that, you know, were backing in the U.S. Mm -hmm. they, a they, lot of them left on boats. And man, the, the story of the boat people and what happened to them is crazy, man. Crazy. There were pirates just waiting in the waters for them. And, you know, women and children were kidnapped and, you know, they would, they would kill everyone on the boats, kill the male on the boat, take all the women and children and put them into sex trade. And, um, you know, I, I met a girl uh, in, in Choice, one, one of the things that we've done right, together, the emotional right. intelligence course, and uh, she was sharing a story about what happened to her mom. She was like eight years old and uh, pirates came on the boat and took her mom. And that was the last time she ever saw her mom. She still has no idea what ever happened to her mom. She's eight years old. She's, you know, they took the, all the women. So, and they were just, you know, they were just basically helpless. They're out there in these small boats yeah. just trying to get to safety, trying to get, go to another country. And there's, you know, all these predators out there in the water. And yeah. it's a crazy world, huh? <laughs> I'll tell you what, Especially man. The, this COVID era, right? <laughs> hey, we're people, seeing it. We're, it's always been crazy, but now we're kind of seeing more things, you know? People don't realize how lucky they are, man, to be living in the United States. And I think a lot of people, you know, want to complain and, and focus on all the things that are wrong with uh, with the U.S. And, and the United States. But, man, if, you, if you, you live in the United States, you won the lottery, mm. you know? 
it's uh it's it's pretty even even with all the things wrong if you go travel the world and see what happens in other countries and see what's going on in other countries and tra- have you know it's yeah. uh do you ever go to brazil yeah many times i i think i probably i probably been there eight or nine times mm. you know what I'm so, so the first time i went uh i went with rose gracie mm. horian's daughter yeah um and uh yeah i went i went with her and stayed for i think two and a half months okay and um where'd you guys train at well i trained a little bit i trained a little bit at umaita and okay. but i was staying out in hikreo okay yeah, you know yeah. where hikreo yeah, is yeah, it's and at the time side, hikreo is side, yeah. all the way on the other side of the mountain Rio, yeah. past baja even right? right and at the time it was not even developed and so um you know it was weird too because coming to like at, you know training with hickson and then coming to um, Brazil in training, I, I realized the, how lucky I was, mm. right? Because I was already training with the, the best teacher in the world. Um, and the other thing back then too, is one of the things I, I, I noticed, and it was a big problem for a lot of Americans back then. And I don't know if you experienced any of it, but there was quite a bit of discrimination. Mm. Um, they did not really want me to learn Mm. they were not interested in really me learning and getting better um they were interested in using me as a body or having Mm. dudes beat me up i mean i I remember going into when i remember there was a a time where um hoyler brought a group of guys to you know to train for the pan ams and i was i was a blue belt at the time and um i was going against one of his blue belts one of the guys that was going to be competing in the pan ams and tough kid but i caught him once uh I caught him with a foot lock, actually. And then we went again, I caught him with a knee bar. And back then I was I was starting to play around with all the like the leg, leg attacks locks. and stuff like that because Not that different era too, right? Of, yeah. It was no a, leg locks and stuff, but didn't do leg well, locks. It was yeah, it was it was during an era where it was very frowned upon, mm. right? Attacking the legs, they considered it cheap or dirty. Mm. So different now. Um and that was just because uh I was friends with Eric Paulson. And, uh, you know, some of the guys there and Eric sh- from shoot fighting and stuff like that. And so, um, that stuff, they, th- they use those attacks a lot. So I was learning some of that stuff and I was testing it out. And back then a lot of guys were playing, um, spider guard, deli Hiva and stuff like that. And so they were pushing their legs out, putting their legs out a lot. And so I was attacking the legs anyways, before the match even finished, before the time even ran out, cause I caught the kid twice. Mm really fast where they pulled him out and put it, put a purple belt against me. And then, you know, I was like, Oh geez, uh, purple belt. Right. And I started giving it to the purple belt. Mm. And before the match was even over again, Hoyler pulled that guy out and put a black belt against me. Of course I just got like mauled by the mm. black belt, but uh, even like the instructors of the school were like Hoyler, dude, that's not cool. Like, and so that was kind of, that was before my trip to Brazil. And that was kind of the experience I had in Brazil too. You know, that, that, you know, you can't, you're not, don't really train. Don't put it on any of the guys. Don't, you know, let them beat you up because if you start winning, you know, you're, you're considered the enemy. And so I didn't really have a good experience, um, training in Brazil, but I had a a great experience, uh, partying in Brazil. (laughs) (laughs) Man, cause real, real, there's so many foreigners coming in, you know? Yeah. And so uh, that's like when I went to, when I went to Baja, you know, that's kind of then that, that they were like, look, but kind of right. They didn't want you to. They were kind of a little threatened and stuff. I was a young kid, but so yeah. they didn't think much of me. They weren't threatened by me. But, you know, just, that was like kind of the general. Well, uh, even, attitude. you know, so like Scotty Nelson's one of my good yeah. friends and he, you know, he was one of the first American jujitsu guys over there. Right. They were with on the mat and they were filming all yeah. of the, yeah. you know, they were going there filming all the footage from all the yeah. tournaments and then, you know, making tapes and selling the tapes and of all the awesome matches. Yeah. And, um, you know, same thing with him. Like I, after, after, after that first time going down there, I went back many, many more times because, um, I would go down to visit Scotty and hang out with Scotty. Mm. And I had a good friend of mine, a guy named Dallas, who, um, super wealthy guy in LA, uh, he went down to Brazil, loved it. 
And um, he was like, wow, everything is so inexpensive here. Plus, there's so many hot chicks down here, <laughs> right? And we would go out to nightclubs and we would just like, you know, tables and bottles. And the, it was kind of like cr the crazy days. And uh, so he loved it. He ended up getting a house down there oh, wow. in like a, a little community. And so he rented this house year round and different groups of guys would fly in. And it was, I mean, it was a, just a ridiculous house. It was like a five bedroom house with a indoor outdoor pool that you could jump in from the indoors and swim outdoors and it was just retarded and you know you know when you have um i don't i don't know how the economy is now in brazil but back then when you had money you were just a, a baller yeah right yeah, if yeah. you had a little bit of money and so he was he was a wealthy dude um and so we were going to brazil a lot you know yeah. every year or twice a year sometimes yeah, I remember the, the money was like one to one the first time I, mm -hmm. when I went down to Brazil, but then the next year it like doubled and then it kept going up, right? Yeah. Tripled. Yeah, we were down there one time where it was almost four to one. Yeah, four to one. Yeah. 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 And I, I think I met Kenny Florian down there yeah. and yeah. Some OG, OG Americans, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Scotty, they were all training at Baja and, you know, back then I wasn't allowed to go to train at Baja. That was the, that was the school that was close Right, right. I, I had to go to I had to go to Humaitá to train, right? Because otherwise I was right. a cre creonchi. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm yeah. staying in a creo, and I can go to Baja, right, which is right next door, but I had to go all the way to Humaitá to train, you know, which is, you know, an hour and a half or more by the other side. The Cerrito Janeiro, it's like like the nice areas of like the, the south zone. And so Baja is on one side and then Recur was even farther on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then on the way other side is the so Maita. Through yeah. Sancoja, Leblanc, through, through Copacabana, all the, yeah, Leblanc, Copacabana, yeah. all that stuff to get to. Yeah. So yeah, they, they definitely didn't want to make it easy, easy. You know, I was, I was blessed cause I met Draculino and I, I ended up in Belo Horizonte, like Belo Horizonte, okay, yeah. Belo Horizonte you know, like third largest city. And because there weren't a lot of, of uh, foreigners there, I was able to kind of assimilate mm -hmm. in, you know, and Draculino was like really like a straightforward guy. Yeah. And his integrity is really high anyway. So like I was able to kind of become one of the, the guys, you know, the team. Oh, that's awesome. So I had like, because of that, because of Draculino, because of that team, I felt like, you know, like that was my team. That was my family. And yeah. they were still connected to this day, you know, because of that's that. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, twenty five years, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's but. crazy the the rivalries and the politics that went on back in the days. It's, it's it's and I, when I went there, it was only white and blue, whites and blues. You know, he was just starting his gym, so that's why I was able to kind of he yeah. really, you know, when he, he's trying to prove that you know his team's the best, he puts his all puts into so much effort into the into, team. Yep. Yeah, and so I was able to because of that, it was the right timing. Yeah, and I was my instinct because at Grace Wah, there was it was all black belts at those times. You know, the who's who in sport jujitsu. Yeah. So I just followed my instinct, luckily, and then I had like a different experience, you know, because of that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, but it's like I there's so to, much. There's I so talk much. Talk about that those old days, and it's so different now, right? Like now, it's not a big deal for you to go visit other schools. Now it's not a big deal. Like guys can kind of cross train a little bit, and it's when not. Do you, when do you think that started? That that sh that shift? Probably the internet. Internet. It, I, I think when uh, more Americans started opening up schools mm. because it just became, because that's just more right. American culture is right. more, um, they're more business savvy. Right. And they're like, okay, someone wants to come to my school and pay for a class and train. Yeah. I'm going to take their money. Right. And so I think it became more about the customer and, and, you know, mm. um, customer service and, and, you know, yeah, come in and buy a t-shirt and marketing. And, and when the business mindset came in and you really started dealing with uh, American school owners that it, that it really became more okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Going back to your, your, your you, you moved to Hicks and Gracie's mm -hmm. the early days. Talk to me about the early days. How was that? How was, how was the environment? Cause you know, Sean Flannery talked, you, you talked about you and your brother a lot actually. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So I just I want to hear from you from your yeah well so Sean I think started in ninety he started in two thousand mm. ninety nine two thousand when we had uh, opened up the school on Wilshire Boulevard so that was Hickson's last school the school on Wilshire um, where we started was on Pico Pico so we had the school on Pico for a couple of years um, 
and then we moved up to the Palisades for a couple of years. We had a school up in the Palisades for a couple of years. Um, so back in the early days, I mean, again, you know, kind of like you, it was me uh, going to the right place at the right time. Mm. It was, it, there was a lot of luck involved, like back in the day. So Hickson was still training and fighting, right? He's still active. He was still active in fighting. And so I got to see and experience a lot of the fight camps and how he was training for the fights. And um, back then there was a lot of guys from Brazil coming up, you know, Fabio Grigel. Um, it was back in the Pride and Valley Tudo days, you know, so guys were coming out to train with Hickson all the time. Um, so, and Hickson was still super, super active. He was training every day. So he would do a, a noon class. He would teach in the afternoons and his noon class would be packed. There'd be like, you know, back then to have 40, 50 guys on the mats was pretty crazy. That was, that was a big class. So we would have like 40, 50 guys on the mats during the noon class. And so it was really cool because I got to uh, spend so much time training with him. Mm. You know, he was teaching every day in the afternoon. Um, so I just got to, I got to be around him. I got to learn a lot from him. I got to train with him a lot. You know, for the first five years, he was still super, super active. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and then Hoxon was still around Hoxon. Yeah. yeah. Hoxon was still around. He was training and me and Hoxon, you know, um, when I first started, Hoxon was still very, very young, but the last like two years, uh, of his life, we had become very, very close and we were hanging out all the time. And, you know, I was a few years older than him. Um, but yeah, I was, I, at the time I was, you know, running nightclubs and stuff like that and bouncing at nightclubs and he'd want to go out and like hang out. And he was kind of blowing up as a, as a model. He was modeling a lot and, you know, kind of getting to the LA scene. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we, we hung out and spent a lot of time together. And Kron, Kron, Kron was a kid. Kron was just a little kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was a little, little punk kid. <laughs> and then when Hickson, so Hickson, Hickson went back to Brazil, right? After... Shortly after Hoxon? Um, no, he uh, he went back to Brazil. Uh, he was in, well. He was in Brazil at the time that Hoxon disappeared, and then uh, and then he came back, and then we found out, you know, that Hoxon had passed. Um, we everyone was looking for him for a while, and nobody kind of knew what happened. And then uh, they found him in New York, um, and then. Uh, yeah, the um, Hickson didn't go back to Brazil for probably, I think he went back in 2006 or 2007. Hmm. 2006 or 2007, he went back to Brazil. Um, and I think what happened was he went back to Brazil on vacation, and then he met his uh, wife now, I think her name is Cassia. Mm. So, you know, and then he ended up separating from his then, you know. Hmm. I see. That's kind of what happened. Yeah. So at, at the time, you know, in, in 2000 um, is when I started teaching at the school. Um, I was a brown belt at the time, but uh, the main instructor who we had, Luis Heredia, mm. uh, moved to Hawaii and opened up a school in Maui. Maui, yeah. And so... Um, I was kind of the senior student. They brought in another black belt, one of Hoyler's black belts from Brazil to teach a guy named Mario Aiello, oh, Mario. but Mario didn't speak any English. <laughs> His English was terrible. Could be competing right. against the students and stuff back in Brazil. <laughs> so Mario, he's a, he's a character, um, didn't speak any English, but he also had a, a, a completely different style than Hickson. He, he'd never, he had not trained right. with Hickson. And so, I was there to make sure they, they felt it was important to have a black belt at the school mm. teaching the classes so that when people go in that, Oh, you guys have a black, there's a black belt teaching. But I was the one really teaching because I was the one that sp spoke English and I was also the one that knew Hickson style. So I was there to make sure that the students are learning Hickson's jujitsu mm. and that's representing. That's the only jujitsu that I had ever learned. Yeah. Right. So I started as a white belt with Hickson mm. You know, so I was, went through all my belts with Hickson. That's amazing. And when did you get your black belt? What year? I got my black belt in 2004. 2004. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
What a what a journey, huh? Did you yeah. journey? We think about it. Well, <laughs> like twenty. It's crazy because I look years. back, and um, at the time, I was like, "Man, what a crazy idea!" Like, you know, I was so certain in my head, I'm gonna move out to LA. I'm gonna leave my family, leave all my friends, leave everything I know behind, move out to LA, and I'm gonna get a black belt from this guy Hicks and Gracie, who's mm-hmm. the best in the world. And at the time, no American had gotten a black belt from Hicks. Right. You know, so I was like, okay, I'm going to do something that's never been done before. I'm going to, I'm going to get my black belt from this guy, no matter how long it takes, no matter what it takes. That's my goal. And I just put my head down and stuck to it and showed up at the gym every day and trained and, you know, I had injuries and some crazy stuff happened, you know, on the way where I had to take some time off. And what kind of injuries have you had? uh, Blew up both my knees. Mm -hmm. It was a, my first day as a purple belt competed in, um, the Copa Pacifica tournament. Clever, clever. And uh, won my division. Uh, they gave me they gave me the purple belt that morning, right? Hickson gave me the purple belt that morning, said you're competing as a purple belt today. Because back then they only allow two, guy, two guys from each school mm-hmm. in each division. And then they put you on opposite ends of the bracket, right? We had two guys and so they, they gave me a purple belt. Uh, and I ended up winning my division and then I fought in the open division and I blew out my knees. I went for like a drop Sanagi and uh, the guy that I was competing as a Brazilian guy, um, he was way heavier than me, a big, big, you know, on a lot of acai. He must have eaten a lot of acai. Acai power. Yeah, acai power. But uh, I went for a drop Sanagi and he j- j- kind of jumped and sprawled to the side and both my knees kind of buckled. Buckled. Blew out both my knees. And then I didn't have insurance at the time. So I kind of rehabbed myself. It took me a year. Mm. Um, I had to, you know, not train for almost a year mm. to be able to rehab my knees. Um, they wanted to do, I didn't have insurance. So they wanted to do surgery. I went to um, Harbor UCLA. Mm. It's like a county hospital where they're like, okay, we're going to have one of our, you know, it's basically the doctors there are like intern guys and we're, we're going to, yeah, knees. both your knees, both your ACLs are blown out. So here's what you, we got to do, do. Was there, did, did, you did MRIs and stuff, your mm-hmm. ACLs? Yeah. So they're like, here's what we got to do. We got to do surgery on this knee first, and then it's going to take you six months to rehab it. And then once this knee gets strong, then we got to do the other knee because you got you have to have one leg that you can kind of walk on or hobble to, on to be able to Function. do your do your physical therapy right to to be able to recover. So I was like, well, that means I'm going to be out a year anyway. So let me just see if I can fix myself in a year. Mm. And so I just took the year off and I started like weight training and started doing you know just everything I could, everything. I, and I was talking to everyone. I we had a lot of good, um, really really smart personal trainers and guys that were into like health, fitness, nutrition, uh, at the gym. And so I would just pick their brains and I would just do everything I, you know, everything I could. And I ended up rehabbing my knees, mm. but I still have my, my, you know, no ACL in both knees. It's kind of crazy. Does it, uh, separate? Like, does it, uh, Oh yeah. I, I walk, should let you put your, my, my hand out. Like when I, when I, when I wiggle my knee, it mm. gaps, mm. you can feel it like opening up, but there's enough stability that you can. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I just got used to training on it, knowing what angles I can put my knee, mm. um, and knowing how to, you know, knowing how to move and which it's, it's like anything, right? Like guys get injured and they have certain handicaps and you figure out because you're Adapt, so passionate yeah. about training, you yeah. just figure a way to train around it. And so that's what happened. You know, I got strong enough. I was doing tons of legs, tons of stability stuff, tons of balance drills, um, and just managed to get myself to where I could, you know, I had, I had a, not only torn ACL, but a torn meniscus mm. too, which was popping and clicking. And, you know, I was able to actually, um, rehab myself and be able to train for a few more years before I actually finally did uh, surgery on the meniscus. Did you have any other injuries? Um, Major ones? I've had, I've had some shoulder stuff okay. go on. Nothing that I've never, I've ever had to have, um, surgery for. Mm. Um, I had a detached retina mm. that showed up out of the blue and, uh, I'm not sure how that happened. They say it could happen from, uh, they, it could happen from getting thrown mm. from taking an impact, but, um, I had a detached retina and that was in 2000 probably 2008 
detached retina. Mm-hmm. So what, what do you feel when you have a detached retina? Nothing. So that's the crazy thing. You don't feel anything. Um, could you, you could still see normally. Well, so here, here's what happened. I was in Oklahoma city teaching a seminar and at the seminar, there was a, a one of the students is an eye doctor and I wore contacts at the time. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I said, Hey, you know, um, when are you leaving? And I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. He goes, Oh, well you should come into my office in the morning and let me just check out your eyes. You know, I'll give you a free checkup. Mm. Um, and I was like, oh, I don't really have time. You know, uh, my flight leaves in the afternoon. And he's like, oh, you should just do it, you know, for free. And so I thought about it. And then the next morning I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to go and let him check out my eyes. So he's doing an eye checkup on me, right? Giving me a new prescription and everything. And uh, he goes, oh, let me do one more test. Last test he does, he's looking, you know, there's like a bright light in my mm. eye. He's looking, he's like, he goes, hold on a second. This is not, something's not right. He's like, hey, man, we got to get you a specialist right away. I'm like, what? He goes, you have a lot of blood behind your eye. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, we got to get you to a specialist right now. So I was like, okay. So he calls uh, another guy who's a retina specialist, Mm -hmm. and they sent me to this guy. And the guy's like, yeah, your retina is detached. Mm -hmm. So the part of my retina that was detached was on the left side on this side. And so with your vision, what happens is your vision like crisscrosses when it comes in through the eye and like how the light refracts. Mm. So the retina on this side makes up for the vision on this side. And so what happened was this eye was compensating. I didn't notice that my vision had gone bad because we never walk around like this, right? And so what happened was my vision was missing from this side. So they're like, we got to do surgery right on now. On this side of your of your eye? On this side of my, yeah, from this of eye, this side. That side. So they're like, we got to do surgery right now. And I'm like, no, I can't do surgery. I, I, I got to fly back. You know, I'm flying back to LA in a couple hours. Mm-hmm. And they're like, uh, and the crazy thing is with the surgery, you can't fly for six months for a couple months, for oh, two wow. months, actually, it was two months. Okay. You're not allowed to fly because they, they inject a gas bubble into your eye. So I'm like, Great. no, I can't stay here in Oklahoma for, for two months. Two months, yeah. You know? So they're like, okay, well, you can fly back, but this is, this is super important because you could lose your vision. Hmm. So um, he called a friend of his who was a retina specialist in LA, and literally I flew back that day, and the next morning I was in for surgery. And uh, the recovery from retina surgery is pretty crazy. Um, I had to lay on my side blindfolded for two months. Lay on your side. So when you sleep, you have to so, lay on your side. No. Just. I have to lay on my side. I couldn't move for two months on my side. I was able to get up for about an hour, half a day. All day long? Yep. So... That was uh, probably one of the most uh, profound experiences of my life. Um, What happened was, so they they did an operation which is called a sclerobuckle with a vitrectomy. Sclerobuckle is they basically tie a rubber band around your eyeball and a vitrectomy is they stick a needle in your eye and they inject a gas bulb. So what happens when the retina detaches is they have to reattach it and hopefully you get your vision back. It's not a guarantee. I didn't get mine back. Um, but they, the gas bubble is there to basically, so the reason I had to lay on my side was because the bubble floats mm. and the bubble is supposed to put pressure on your eyeball and then the, the rubber band around the retina to basically help push everything together so it can heal. It's basically just to kind of help it keep contact. Mm. And so, um, and then I was blindfolded because I'm not supposed to move my eyes around. They don't want you like moving your eyes around, look, sitting up, looking. And and so, because they want the gas bubble to be in one place. They want there to be constant pressure on the eyeball in one place so that it can heal. They don't want, you know, like moving around. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't want your eyes moving around. So no TV, no reading books, um, no nothing. So I basically uh, got up once a day to eat and shower i mean i would like i would shower probably every every other day Mm. um because i was just laying in bed Uh, but during that time i listened to i went through like 40 something audiobooks okay i was gonna say 
Yeah, I audiobooks did. saved my life. It saved your life. <laughs> like, what do you do with? How do you keep? How do you keep saying? Right. Yeah, audiobooks, and I started meditating, mm. and I started meditating. That's the first time I ever started uh, meditating, and just. Um, how, how did the meditating help you? Man, it was uh, for being coming from such an active lifestyle where you're used to training three or four or five hours a day, right? To having to lay still mm. for 20 something hours, you know, um, is crazy. And so it just helped me to be able to relax and be, you know, find peace and like just be okay with everything. I mean, it was a crazy experience because, you know, you're obviously you're not working or doing anything. And so just being so type A, like, oh, man, I'm not being productive. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. It just it really helped just kind of put everything at peace. You know, it's crazy about uh, how much uh, atrophy my body went through, too. You know, when you're laying in bed for two months and you're not really moving around, you're not being physical, you're not being active, you're not getting your heart rate up. That was the other thing. They don't want your heart rate going up a bunch. Right. Because that affects the blood vessels in your eyes and everything. Um, I had stitches in my eyeball. That was pretty crazy. I remember the first night um, after the surgery, because you're on, on painkillers, but um, just moving my eyeballs around, you could feel like the stitches in the back of your eyeball, like scratching the back. So um, there's a video on YouTube if anybody wants to see what the... Uh, what's, what's that under? Scleral buckle with vitrectomy. Look up that surgery. It's pretty with crazy. Name? Or just, just no, it's not right, not right. with my name. But, but there's a, a video. yeah, there's a video on That's YouTube. Crazy, it's man. pretty crazy. They they take these tongs and they open up your eye, and you have four muscles that attach to your eyeball that control the movement up and down and left and right. And they take these um, prongs and they pull your eyeball out <laughs> through with the muscle. You know, they'll hook onto the muscle. It's and crazy they pull what, your they can, out. what they can do now, huh? It's, it's crazy. It's pretty crazy. Like my friend had open heart surgery. Like just the random tear in his one of the main valves in the heart. It's just they put him in a coma, froze him, like made him put him below whatever the the degree that they had to put him. Yeah. And then put he was dead for like ten minutes, and then it's did the surgery, and then nuts. brought him back to life. Yeah, that's, that's so <laughs> insane when you think about. And how important the eyes are, right, for our, for our survival and for life, right? Yeah, so absolutely. So that's such a big piece. Well, that was huge because that's like one of the ways that we connect to the outside world, right? Like as human beings, mm -hmm. most of the information that we have, they say 70, 80% of the information that we take in from it comes in through it's our visual, eyes. Yeah. Like shapes, colors, movement, right? And so um, it was really, really crazy to not have any eyes to be blindfolded for two months. One of the things I did notice was my other senses started to heighten Got better. to make up for it um noise my my hearing became so sharp during that time um it was really interesting because i could and maybe it was just because i'm it was just peace and quiet mm. where i was staying but i could start i could hear the neighbors talking in the house next door so that was pretty i was like whoa i can actually hear what they're saying and you know, yeah, they say, right, like the, like the, your visual, right? The, you have three satellite systems, right? And if, like where you're at, how you, where you are, right? Uh -huh. Your visual, your vestibular, right? Your, you know, how your head moves in space yeah. and then like all the, you know, your joints and your skin, right? Pro perception. And so, yeah, if that visual thing is out of whack, your whole body's in, in trauma right? yeah. the whole time. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, to have good. stitches in your eyeball. It was good. I was just, you know, quarantined to my, to my bed. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, even then, you know, it, it was um, trying to be productive and trying to learn, okay, let's make the best use of this time mm -hmm. since I can't do anything physical. I can't move around. Let me just see what I can learn. And mm -hmm. so I just started downloading audiobooks, downloading audio a bunch books. of audiobooks. And, you know. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Now, going back to the Hicks and the, 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 like the teaching and everything, what's different what do you feel like is special, uh, like training with Hickson? You know, you went from white belt to black belt. What's what separates Hickson? I got to train with him one time. Luckily, I was like, man, uh, it was at Fabio Lopoldo's and and oh, yeah, Thousand yeah. Oaks, you went to that. Know, uh, or, or Ventura. Yeah, and uh, I was like, oh man, I, I'm I'm gonna go. I never got to train with Hickson. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna seize the moment. And I drove there and, and trained with them, and I was like, man. You know, just the it, like basic things, but like details, there's levels, you know, right? Absolutely. And so for me, I was like, yeah, there's, there's levels and he's on another level. 
So is that that was your that experience? was my that was my experience that I that I felt you know uh-huh. just like simple things but no there it's deeper right deeper yeah he would take you deeper into the fundamentals right mm-hmm. yeah so what he show what he show then do you remember it was like a back take um, from the from guard close guard yep he how to his move hips. his yeah, hips yeah. out and how to basically flatten the guy how to keep mm-hmm. your your back your top leg heavy on the back mm-hmm. so the guy can't follow you right yeah that was like the uh, that's what I remember and then. Uh, I think it was like keeping your base too on top, mm-hmm. something like that. On the feet. Um, I th- yeah, on the, I think it was being mounted. Like it was mm. the mount position as well. Okay. That I remember. Pinching like your those knees two things. And, and not letting the guy push you off. Yeah, it's just the control. Simple stuff. Yeah, simple stuff. But, you know, like How to simple stuff. Hips. Oh, I know that. You don't know that. <laughs> I, well, I didn't know that. He does that to everybody, either. right? Yeah. He does that to everybody. And he'll always like, and what he does is he'll be like, okay, he'll call a black belt and show me this or do this with me or do this with me. And then, you know. It, it'll be a basic, what we think is basic, what everyone, you know, it's, it's a, a technique that we've all learned, but he just has elements and details of it that take it to the next level, right? Like, Hey, you could sometimes pull that move off before. Maybe you could get it to work every now and then. Now it's like, it's a different level. It went from you being able to do that move 50, 60% of the time to now it's a 90% of the time. So, um, you know, I, I was, people ask me what my experience training with Hickson is, is that's kind of the only thing I knew, mm. right? And so I was really spoiled by that because, again, at the time, you weren't really, it wasn't really uh, PC to go train, politically correct to go train anywhere else. So I only trained with Hickson. And I, you know, I was very close to Hickson too. Um, I was really close with Hoxson. I was up at the house all the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I had conversations with Hickson. Like I got invited. I had a lot of friends that, that trained at the Gracie Academy in Torrance mm-hmm. where, you know, for a while Hoyce was teaching Hoyce and Horian. Right. That was Hoyce right. and Horian school until the, you know, the kids, Hoyce eventually left and then the kids took over. Um, and then I had a lot of friends at the Machados as well. And I would always be invited to go and train at their schools. And, um, you know, I had a conversation with Hickson one time. I was like, Hey, you know, I got invited to go train here and here. And he said, Henry, listen, anything you want to learn, I can teach you. The only thing that's going to happen if you go over there is they're going to learn from you. Like, and back then it was, it was that competitive mindset, right? Like everyone's competing against everyone and you're with this school and you're with that school. So you don't want your secrets or this information that you're learning at this school to get out. And I understand Hickson's reasoning it for it now because the last <coughs> six, seven years, I've been traveling all over the world, teaching seminars, teaching camps, teaching seminars to students from all different affiliations. And as you know, you know, different schools have different styles. They have different techniques, different ways they prefer to do things, you know, like 10th planet has their system. And then, you know, each different school kind of has a a system of how they go about doing things. And, um, it is different. Mm. You know, the way that, uh, I was taught to do the fundamentals and a lot of the basics, um, is very, very different than how other schools were taught. And there was, um, a lot of details that I learned uh, that for some reason we're not taught mm. other places. We're not taught. Uh, and, uh, as when I go teaching those things, you know, the constant feedback that I always get is, and especially it's from black belts. And the, and I feel the reason that I get it so much from black belts is because these are guys that have had the most amount of experience, have been spent years and years and years in the art. And then, um, I kind of expose them to little intricacies and little details that help them do something that they've already done 10,000 times better. Mm. And that's, I think what Hickson's jujitsu is really about. I mean, his, his basics are so strong. Um, his fundamentals and his basics are so strong that he can do them against anyone. Mm. Right. I mean, a big part of his training because he, at a period of time, I, I asked Hickson, it was one of the big lessons for me that I learned was, um, I asked him, I said, Hey Hickson, you know, you hear this term all the time, like, um, what is it? 
steel sharpened steel or something like that. Or, you know, like yeah. you got to train with tough right. guys right, to get right. tough. You got to train with guys better than you to get better, right? Hickson, you've been the best guy in the world now for the last 25 years. Who do you train with to get better? And he's like, I train with you guys. You know, I train with you guys. And he said, listen, Henry, the training is in the mind. Mm. He goes, if you want to get better, you need to create the training for yourself to make yourself better. Mm. He goes, when I train, it's not about me tapping you out. It's I have something I'm working on or, you know, maybe some days I want to test myself. I put, you know, so like for Hickson, he would let me put him in a rear naked choke. Let me lock it in. He would get out. Let me, he would put himself constantly in bad positions or some days he'd train with one arm, you know, or some days he would train with no arms. Um, sometimes he would train and he'd say, okay, what do you want me to catch you with? Oh, uh, Americano, which arm? Americano from mount or cross side? So you know what's coming, right? And that was a big part of his training. I remember one day he didn't say it, but this is another thing he would do, right? He'd shark tank himself. So it was during the Pan Ams and Hoyler had a whole team of guys down here. He lined up about 20 of us against the wall. At the time I was, I was. What an amazing time to be a part a of that. Blue belt. Of I think Hicks a good, Nixon's good journey blue belt. For you. I'm like, yeah. man, I'm jealous. <laughs> so um, I, I was already a, a, a pretty good blue belt, you know, um, pretty strong blue belt. Um, he lined up 25 against about 25 guys against the wall, one with a black belt first, tapped him out five or six times. Um, plata. Mm. I'm like, Oh wow. He caught him in the am six. Like, Oh, maybe that guy's just susceptible to that move. Next guy taps out five or six times. Um, plata. Right. It was a pro belt. Then it was my turn. Right. Okay. I know what's what he's going for. Taps me out five or six times. Um, plata. And he just went down the row of guys, him sitting in the middle, not, it was literally like an hour and a half training with him sitting in the middle, everyone else resting and watching on the sidelines. Um, he didn't even, he didn't even stop to get a drink of water. It was just boom, 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 tapping everyone out by Umaplata like five or six times. So, you know, by the second guy, I was like, okay, I know it's coming. Hide my arm. Don't let him, you know, mm. I'm trying to hide my arm, hide my arm. And he would still dig still it out. Still get it. You know, and Omoplata is not like a super easy thing to to get, right? But so that's that was how he would train himself. That was and that that just goes, you know, again, why is he so good? Right? What makes him so good is beyond the knowledge of the techniques, is um how he was willing to train himself, how he was always willing to make the training hard and how he could figure out a way to make the training hard for him even when he didn't have hard training right because i mean he wanted to smoke me it would be no problem right but he would always create a training for himself so he, how do i i'm training with this white belt or blue belt or purple belt how do i make this good training for me hmm. because if it's just me i'm just going to tap him out then i'm not going to learn anything he's not going to learn anything. right 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 yeah, it's it's really smart, you know. Like I know Braulio, he moved to the UK. He had no training partners. He created his training partners. I remember moving back from Brazil, being in New Mexico, and I my, made my my students my training partners, you know. Yeah. And you, yeah, you find, but the way he did it, you know, systematically. I was gonna my follow up question for you was gonna be like, what what do you think made him so different, right, and special, you know? And I think you kind of answered and answer that was his mind, how he thought about yeah. things. Every time people ask me that, what makes him different, special is his mind. It's his mind. Um, he he. Even though Hickson is in, you know, great shape, he's got a great combination of flexibility, speed, endurance, and and the breathing. You know, of course, helped him. Um, you know, he attributes his his breath work and his breathing to a part of his success. But it's his mind. I mean, he's he's also um, his understanding of jujitsu, his ability to break down jujitsu, his. Um, you know, I. I when I talk a lot about teachers, teachers of jujitsu, um, I, I make this comparison sometimes. I said, some people, there's some guys that just have a collection of techniques that they know, mm. right? So they've memorized 50, 100, 200 techniques and they know these techniques. Then there are guys that really understand jujitsu, that 
know jujitsu, that understand the art. And it's very, very different. He had such a deep, profound understanding of the art. Um, understand how the human body moves, understand how leverage works, understand how balance, uh, weight distribution, how to shift angles, to neutralize things. So um, body mechanics, all of these elements that are integral to jiu-jitsu connection, the idea of connection, how to transfer energy uh, through your body and into other people, how to transfer energy. Um, like well, I watched the the choke the choke movie with my mom, mm-hmm. and before that, I used to come back with like you know uh, scrapes on my face and you know like bruising and stuff. Yeah. And she's like, I don't know if that's good for you, you know. But then I, ha- I watched the movie Choke with her, and then she became a fan because she she saw the spirit spirit the spiritualness of, uh, of right. Hickson and how he acted and nature and you know what he was about. He's and such a like, charismatic guy. I mean, it's hard charisma. not to like and be enamored with him. Yeah, and so she's like, okay, it's good for you, right? And so what kind of training did he do that set him apart, that made him, you know, more in tune with the breath work? And, like, why did he go down that path? Why did he, you know? Yeah, I don't Because it's different from, like, his brothers. Well, Halls was really right. into, um, Halls was very much into, and I think Halls, uh, a lot of people don't give Halls enough mm-hmm. credit because he, you know, Hall's passed away at a very right, young right, age. Right. But I mean, I, I know from Hickson that Hall's was his biggest influence mm. in jujitsu. It's crazy. And huh? one guy, like all of the, all of the, the, the trees of, of jujitsu mm-hmm. comes from this man, all the modern jujitsu pretty much, you know, and Hall's. So one of the things that Hall's was really big on was training other martial arts. Mm. And he was training Aikido. He was training judo. He was training, uh, wrestling sambo right and um so he was training other grappling arts and seeing trying to learn what works what doesn't work and trying to incorporate everything into okay this technique you know i learned this technique that's part of this art and just kind of incorporating everything that works into jujitsu right um and so i think that was huge for hickson is just that that influence got him on the right track yeah just i think the mindset of always being open to learning always being open to improving and finding what works finding a better way you know there's some people in jujitsu uh that have the mindset of oh this is the way that we've always done it so this is the way we're going to teach it and this is the way it has to be Mm. um i feel it's a very very closed-minded approach and the other thing with that is, is I saw through the years, you know, I was with Hickson for 15 years, mm. how he would evolve. So mm. in the first few years I was training as a white belt, a blue belt, he would be teaching something one way. And then by the time I was a brown belt, he had figured out a better way to do it. And he would teach it that way. You know, oh, when you do it like this, the guy will sometimes counter or stop it like this. So now I do it like this. Now I do it. So now he can't counter. He can't shut it down or guys will block it like this. So now do it like this. So now it, they can't they can't stop it. So he was always trying to evolve and and develop his jiu-jitsu. And like, again, it goes back to his mind. He was so so smart and so sharp. If you saw Choke, there's a scene towards the end of the of the movie where you see uh elio talking he's talking about hickson how hickson's like the best uh but it shows there's a scene with hickson training with elio in brazil Hmm. and he's actually going over they're playing with the upa escape the bridge yeah yeah the trap but some people call it trap and roll or the bridge right where you trap and roll yeah and what he's doing is he's showing elio how to do it better than the way that they were doing it. Mm. And he teaches this like at a lot of his seminars. I, you know, I've, I don't know if I have a video online on YouTube with it, but I teach it, you know, in my, on my website in jujitsu. So, and I teach it at my seminars and stuff like that. Hidden, but there's hidden jujitsu, mm-hmm, jujitsu.com. How there's, there's a way. So one of the big things, like when you do the trap and roll, right, you trap one arm, but they still have another arm that they can base out with. So you go to bridge them. And a lot of times what happens is guys are falling, they'll post their hand. So there's a very specific angle where you take them, where even if they post with the other hand, they can't, they'll still fall. They're still go. 
And so that's what he's showing Elio in that. So, oh, even if the guy tries to post with his hand, even if he puts his hand out, it doesn't work. You can't base out with your other hand, right? Then that's the biggest problem. Oh, everyone knows they've put your hand here. They're, as soon as you fall, it's almost natural instinct, mm -hmm. right? That you put your hand yeah. to stop your fall. You base out where you're falling. So it's stuff like that, you know, like just. And Elio was open to oh, of course. <laughs> obviously if he's on the video but that's amazing being such a hardcore strict guy you know it's from all the things the stories mm -hmm. that i hear well well i mean you can you can what see a beautiful how moment much, to capture uh, how much at, at the time you know it's sad it's sad how kind of kind of how the family you know kind of everyone kind of went off and did mm -hmm. their own thing um but at the time uh when when they were all still training together how much better hickson was than anybody else mm. you know it was insane like i um my buddy chris told me the story because I, this was back in the day when they were all still training together but he said oh yeah hickson you know put his hands in his pants i was there when hickson tied his hands in his pants was on his back and it was like him and Hoyler and Hoyce and I think uh, one or two of the Machados. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, you guys try to pass my guard. And, um, you know, these guys are all the best dudes in the world, right, yeah, at yeah. the time, yeah. right? And he submitted everyone mm -hmm. with his hands in his pants. Nobody could pass his guard. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But there's so many stories like that. Then there's so many things that like I got to witness myself, like the yeah, all the all the Gracie, all the Gracie Baja guys. Like I think Hickson showed up there one day, and yeah, he came in and just trained with everybody, tapped everybody out. Yeah, I heard he a story that he went to Gracie Baja, and some guy said something about the cross collar choke, and he basically cross, -choked. cross -choked everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. That's no. That's that was that was on the daily. You know, with with Hickson is just. It, it's so crazy because you're constantly in this is a thing. It was like a monthly thing of just in disbelief of how good someone could be at something. You know, it's like you're watching Michael Jordan play, right? right? Um, it, every couple months there'd be a, a black belt world champion that would come in, and this guy would be like the new upcoming guy, and he's smashing everybody, he's submitting everybody, and just running through his division. And then, you know, he'd show up to train at Hickson's or Hickson, he'd be coming through town. Hickson would invite him to come train and we'd be like me and, uh, you know, the, the training partners would be sitting against the wall and be like, okay, this is, this is going to be the one, this guy is going to give him a hard time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, let's see. And then you'd see Hickson just walk through them and you'd just be like, like, did he really just feel like that born, born that a champion, easy? born a champion, like took a lot of those elements of like Hickson, the Hickson you yeah. know, things, right? I mean, it was, that's what it was. And, and it's cool. Sean, um, Sean, when Sean started training, he spent so much time, man. He was, he was like me, mm -hmm. you know, he found it, fell in love. And he literally was, when he was not working, he was at the Academy. He was like living at the, he was doing privates every single day, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it, it was kind of cool, man. And, and Hickson, obviously took a took a liking to him because Sean's just a very very charismatic guy you know and so it was cool that Sean get to really spend a bunch of time with Hickson back in those days that was kind of Hickson in those days he was still contemplating whether he was going to fight again or not he was still kind of getting over the emotional loss of Hoxson mm -hmm. and so um you know but there was that it was still on the table for him because he was still you know kind of in his prime and so, um, yeah, he was, you know, Hickson would show up to teach and it was cool that I'm glad Sean had the experience and the guys at the time had the experience of being able to train with Hickson. And the crazy thing about Hickson is even as he was getting older, <coughs> his technique was constantly getting better. Like it's literally, I think, I think his brain is probably just processing jujitsu, you know, 24 seven. It's inspiring. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that should be the goal for all of us, right? To yeah. Keep improving and. Well, Every I mean, decade, stay on the mat, stay healthy. That's why, like that, ta I was showing the attack with stuff that mm -hmm. it's helped me tremendously, you know. But that's what I want for all my friends. Yeah, because guys get a little older and they can't, you know. Maybe they're competing when they're younger, but you want it a part of your a part of your life, right? You right. Keep training without pain. You well, that's feel the good. thing is we all abuse our bodies, right? And and I think that's the thing. The main thing for me, you know, um, is just training smarter, right? And hopefully, we our our jujitsu becomes more efficient with time and we learn to 
basically um, be able to achieve the same results using less strength, mm-hmm. using less energy, using less effort. So that's kind of the goal, yeah. right? Yeah, like Saul, Saul was telling me, Saul Ribeiro was telling me about uh, 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 Helio, how he w- was training with them, and he's like, "You can't, you can't beat me," you know, because his defense was so good, you know. Mm-hmm. He's yeah, like, man, this, this this old man's crazy, you know. Yeah, his well, mindset, you know. And so he, you add and that and put that into mixture with holes and right. into. Ellie was known for that. Like even even when he was like his late eighties. Yeah, you yeah. know, getting on the mat with there, blue yeah. belts, young guys, and just and he was for him it was just doing positional training, and it was just to stay sharp. You know, he would say, "Okay, you mount me, and you try to finish me." Or, okay, you you right. get on the cross leg with me and see if you can finish me. He wouldn't even try to escape. It's just see if you can finish me, you know. And it was just creating that mindset of invincibility. Hey, you know, I'm I'm a 90 year old guy, <laughs> and you're in the dominant position, but you can't beat me. Yeah, it's amazing, man. Man, we talked about Choice Center before. Like, uh, you know, mm-hmm. like I just I just finished my I'm on my third week of the leadership. You know, um, what brought you to the Choice Center? Um, emotional intelligence and, and leadership like uh, training right well um scotty nelson one of like you my, know, like our, me <laughs> yeah one of our good friends um who's a like you know one of the ogs he's he's probably knows more people in the jiu-jitsu world than anyone right um he had done it and it was profound for him he had such a um, a life-changing experience from it he basically told me dude, this changed my life. It helped me so much with so many things. And at the time I was going through a lot of just mental struggle. Um, I had a lot of things going on in my life at the time, like a breakup and, uh, um, was starting a new business and wasn't making any money. Um, with the dynamics, dynamics mm-hmm. MMA, yeah. yeah, you know, and you know, you know how it is when you just first start out in a new business. And, and the other thing too, is going just because, you are good at teaching martial arts doesn't mean you're going to have you're, a da- you're dating Ro- Ronda Rousey right too back back is that right at the same time uh no, no. okay no, no. before that okay yeah so um so yeah i was just uh you know i went because i was i'm always open to learning yeah, and, yeah. and just improving and i think yeah, that's why i was jujitsu it jujitsu itself is a i think is a is a amazing tool for personal development right um the tool, I, right? Yeah, I think everybody everybody I talk to that has trained for a long enough time says how much it's changed them as a as a human being, mm. right? Helped them with so many personal stuff. Like a lot of people, just on a not even long term, but just on a, on a daily basis, like the stress relief, you know the. And then we we always talk about how many the lessons that you learn on the mat and how to overcome struggle and how to. Mm put yourself in uncomfortable situations, how to learn to relax and, and just deal with stress and all these lessons that you learn on the mat. So for me, I, that's always been big. When I, w- when I had my eye surgery, you know, um, I really started getting into kind of that personal development type of work. Um, so I was just listening to books on how to, on spirituality, mm. also um, how to just become a better person and just trying to understand what's our purpose in this, on this, uh, you're wise on this planet, right? What is, excuse me, what is, what is the purpose of life and what is, what are we really here for? And trying to, you know, um, develop a sense of meaning for life. And, um, and so that's what led me to, to doing it. And, um, I tell everybody now I've had, I've done two things that were, I think very, very life changing for me. Um, in a very, very short period of time. And it was Choice Center. Mm. Um, those first two weekends, um, probably the most transformation that I've done in myself and, and just inner work, right? It's not easy. It's it's very difficult, the, the process that you go through. Um, but you learn so much about yourself in the process. Uh, it was huge, huge for me. And um, I did a 10-day complete silent meditation workshop to it's called vipassana huh. and it's 10 days of complete silence where you don't even like make eye contact with other people um and you're meditating for like 12 to 14 hours a day huh. and that was um super super uh life changing for me so those those two experiences i actually did the the vipassana workshop first and I was just like, wow, this is so amazing. And um, 
and then I did, did choice later, which is, it's a different type of inner work. You know, it's, uh, it's really understanding yourself and getting deep down into your thought process, the subconscious thought process and understanding like why you do what you do and, and does that serve you or not? Right. And if not, like how, how, how do we shift it? How do we change it? So that's super powerful is giving you the tools to be able to change the things in your life that are not serving you anymore. Right. And different things serve you at different times. That's, that was another huge learning for me. Like, Hey, that, you know, being like that or acting that way, I'm still carrying on these patterns that I was, these behaviors that I was doing before, even though I don't need to now. Yeah. I mean, come from like a, you know, athletic, like from some athletes, right? They don't want to do that kind of work because they don't want some of those, th th you need those kinds of things, right? To make you perform. Yeah. Excel, right. right? But as you get older, like some of those things backfire, right? And can really hurt you. Right. Well, exactly. And it's like, like jujitsu is such a metaphor for life, right? Like, like we used to train hard and now that you're, you know, as we age, your body just doesn't recover as quickly mm -hmm. and injuries build up. So you have an accumulation of injuries. And so training at that intensity doesn't serve you anymore. So you're going to have to shift, mm -hmm. right? If you want to keep doing jujitsu, you can't train like the 20 year old dude that's, you know, thinks he's going to compete every weekend. Yeah. Right. If you look at, look at the guys that are the Muay Thai fighters, right. They start training when they're like, you know, six, seven, eight, and they start fighting when they're 12, 14. And then, by 20 years old in Muay Thai, you're already an old fighter, right? And yeah. most of the guys are retired in their 20s. They start when they're little kids, right? Yeah, in and they're retired by their 20s. So, you know, uh, you just have to be aware of what is the, you know, if I want to keep doing this thing that I love, right? As your body gets older and as you, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to change if you want to be able to keep doing it. How did Dynamics MMA, how did that, how did that, how did that come together? Anthony Hardunk, uh, who's a K1, he was a K1 fighter, um, K1 kickboxer. Um, he was training at uh, one of our affiliates in the Netherlands, and he came to LA to to train. Mm. Um, and I was one of the instructors at the school, and back then I had this apartment that, it was like a three-bedroom apartment, but it was kind of like a jiu-jitsu hostel. Like anyone that was traveling, because we would have guys coming in from out of town that would want to come train with Hickson, and that was their dream. And LA is so expensive, yeah. you know, as a city to like get a get a hotel, hotel or whatever. Yeah. I would always just offer guys my place to stay. I was like, hey, you can just sleep on like we have mats uh, in my living room and a couch. You know, you can come over and just crash at my place if you don't want to spend the money. So that way you can, because we, because man, training at our school was expensive, you know. So. Um, I mean, back, I think back then it was like 200 or 220, which is unheard of back then, mm. you know? Um, so I would always offer guys my place. So Anthony came and, and stayed with me and, uh, you know, we were training and I knew Hickson already told me like, he's a really, really good kickboxer, right? He was from the Voss gym, which is like the top gym in the so Netherlands. He's a big guy. <laughs> he's a big dude. Oh, well, you, you know, he was Ernesto who's training partner yeah. for 17 years. Right. And he's and all those guys in the Netherlands are monsters. Yeah, they're big they're dudes. Big dudes. So, um, so he stayed with me, uh, he was training, um, he wasn't getting fights in K1 because they had too many guys fighting in the K1 from the Netherlands at the time. And he was expressing to me his frustration. So, uh, I helped get him into the UFC. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who, um, was an attorney for the UFC at the time. And, uh, we ended up putting him in touch with Joe Silva. Um, and he, he, he got a contract with the UFC. So I started helping him when he was fighting in the UFC mm -hmm. and because of that, he wanted to move to the United States cause he's like, okay, MMA is, he recognized even too that MMA was going to take over combat sports, right? Like boxing was dying. Kickboxing was dying. Even though the K one was still big in Japan, he just saw what was going on with MMA and how it was growing. And he kind of realized like, okay, MMA is people. This is what, this is the future. Mm -hmm. So he ended up moving to the United States. And um, at the time, Hickson had ended up moving back to Brazil. So I was teaching at Hickson School. I was uh, the head instructor at the school at the time. And he had moved back to Brazil. And 
what happened was he was separating from uh, his wife and Crone was going to take over the school. Crone wanted to take over the school and I was Crone's teacher. Mm. Right. And so, um, you know, I didn't really want to work for Crone. And I felt that at the time I was 36 at the time I was still running nightclubs in LA. I was still teaching, um, teaching Jiu Jitsu during the week. And I was running nightclubs in LA bouncing at nightclubs and then eventually be, you know, was the door guy to make money because it's just, it's expensive. Right. And it was for me, I wasn't making enough teaching. So, um, I was 36 at the time. I'm like, listen, I, I don't want to keep doing this in time for it. I don't want to keep working at nightclubs. It, it's fun. It was great, but it was, you know, um, it was getting to the point where I was like, I need to make a transition. And so, uh, me and Anthony were talking like, Hey, you know, Hickson's moving back to Brazil. Um, he's probably not coming back. And for me, you know, I was Hickson student. Crone wanted to take over the school and, um, I didn't really want to be an employee for Crone. So I was like, let's, let's start, you know, I felt it was like a perfect time to start dynamics, you know, and for me too, um, I wanted to kind of keep the training and the mindset of the martial arts and, you know, jujitsu was for me when I, when I first started, it was all about fighting, mm -hmm. right? Like learning how to fight and we had challenge matches and it was, a, it was a very different era than it is now. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, that, that at the beginning of the, we're talking about the base and how they all do self-defense. They start from standing and, you know, for me, like coming from that era too, like it's so important that we have those, that a part of your training or have that knowledge ingrained, ingrained in your training. It's always a martial art first and then, right. yes, it, it's an amazing sport as well. But for me, at least, you know, that's, that's my mindset. Yeah. That makes you a complete, you know, right. Jiu-Jitsu, I think Jiu-Jitsu martial artist. Well, that's, I mean, what Jiu-Jitsu was originally intended for, right, is, is, a, is a combat sport, is a martial art. It's, it was originally intended and trained for no time limit, no weight division mm -hmm. fights. That's, you know, when they first did the UFC. The only reason the rules changed in the UFC was to turn it into a sport and to legalize it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think a lot of people don't realize the first few UFCs, the rule set of the UFC is the tournament-style format, but what happened was it became illegal, it was banned in right. 36 states and basically the UFC when when the Fertitas bought the UFC they bought it for two million dollars because it had been banned even on on cable TV you couldn't right. order it in 36 states and so the Fertitas were really smart um, they turned it into a sport they got it sanctioned in Nevada mm -hmm. and then it grew from there but the UFC was going to disappear when they bought it now they dumped tons and tons of money into it you know and then end up selling it for four billion dollars but um yeah people don't realize back then how brutal it was no gloves no gloves right which which no adds, weight division which adds another dynamic to it no right? time limit yeah it does yeah because Bare you have to know different. how to strike with without breaking your hand and that was people don't realize in the tournament format they always had a few alternates so there were fights to be an alternate and they always had alternates because guys would end up breaking their hand in the fight and couldn't continue to the next fight. And so not only to win the tournament do you have to win the matches, but you had to win the first match without getting injured so that you could beat the next guy without getting injured and beat the next guy, you know, to win. I think it was the second one that Hoist had four fights, right? There was three fights the first yeah, one. The yeah, second yeah, one was yeah. four fights. So yeah, people don't <laughs> people crazy. don't realize, you know. Imagine you were Hoist Gracie. <laughs> <Dude. laughs> I asked him like, "What what got you through that? Through that, you know?" It's like his, you know, his family and his belief, right? That, yeah, that was instilled in him. Right. I mean, yeah, there's no other option, you know. And, and and of course, they were so far ahead of their time, right? And and back then, it was really, um, it it wasn't MMA. Like there's so many so many variables that can happen. I mean, one now, punch, nowadays, one slip, one yeah. anything. Well, na well, the thing nowadays is people don't realize nowadays everybody trains jiu-jitsu, right? Back then, that was the beginning days of cross-training in other martial arts. Back then, everyone trained one art and they stuck to it and they everyone thought this is the best because you didn't have this like, you know, there was 
blood sport and the kumite and like these legends and this these are I mean, all that underground was, stuff yeah. <laughs> and nobody's got video and people fights to the death that nobody heard of right but this is like okay let's we're gonna put it on national tv you know on cable tv yeah. so everyone can see and let's let's see yeah. who's who's yeah. let's see whose style really works let's see wh who's the best so um i mean it, it's so nuts when you think about fighting no time limit no weight division bare knuckle headbutts allowed punches to the groin allowed do you remember that do you remember the uh, joe son joe son punches to the groin allowed headbutts allowed and you have to fight three to four guys in one night to win this tournament it's freaking insane who would do that nowadays <laughs> You'd have to completely change your your style. You couldn't I go mean, out there and yeah, just yeah, it's different. It's a different era. It'd be blow, hard to do that. Yeah, you know, go Everybody's as hard as you can for X amount of time. Like you have to really. You know, my my friend, uh, my friend uh, Urapuru, he did like uh, I think three fights in one night. He fought. Uh, it was there was some events, you know, where he fought Babalu, and mm -hmm. but it's a just it's a different era, right? It was yeah. still a different era. Um, you know, you were still, he was still representing jiu-jitsu, but the guys were getting more mixed. You know, they had some jiu-jitsu, some striking, but now in this era where the guy, the kids, they've grown up watching UFC. And yeah, they're training everything. They're training everything. They're training wrestling. It's just and a different era. And, uh, yeah. and the other thing too is like, you, you have one fight, so you know, this is how much time I have to train for. Right. That changes things. When you don't know how long your fight's going to be, you don't know how long you're gonna have to train. So it means you have to train to fight all day, if maybe, right? Yeah. So that changes everything. Yeah. That changes when you when you when you put time time limit restrictions, and then of course, you know the rules of the UFC where you have rounds. That mm -hmm. changes things too because oh, you're on the ground at the end of the first round. You're on the ground, and now you're back on your feet at distance again, mm -hmm. right? That obviously gives an advantage to to the striker. Where okay, we're gonna start you guys back on your feet so you know i think that um yeah it's a very different uh it's a very different world but i mean you can see the influence that jiu-jitsu had on everything i mean jiu-jitsu changed the the martial arts world so it's, it's happy to be you know to see that i never thought i would fight professionally you know and uh and uh yeah. Did you ever think, but I, you know, I ended up doing it. I just wanted to yeah. test myself out and, and then, you know, fighting for like 10 years. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the beginning, I was really just representing jujitsu and that's how I yeah. felt, you know, but uh, did you ever, did you, before your injuries and stuff, want to think about fighting? I had thought about it, um, but I also was very aware that there's no money in it. Mm. You know, there's no, yeah, I got paid. I had to and pay the other thing to, too to, is Hickson was not really interested in training fighters. Mm. He was interested in, in him, in fighting, him huh? fighting and him representing his family and him, uh, him being the kind of the one to be the leader and, and represent the family and take, and, and because of course he's so confident in his skill set, Right. But, um, I don't think he ever felt wanted to put the time and energy i mean because he was so focused on himself you know to put time and energy into training other people mm -hmm. takes away from the energy you you commit to yourself right and so he wasn't interested in training fighters while he was fighting at all he wasn't interested he was you know so that that didn't really op open your mind up maybe too much for yeah that, so that there aspect. was there was that and then also you know when you see the life of a fighter I mean, it's not a very, I, I mean, I know how much UFC fighters were making, right? Because I was, I was helping. I had friends that were in the UFC. Pre-Fertita, pre right? <laughs> even during, yeah. I mean, even during, pre during Fertita. and after as well. Yeah, of but course. even. <laughs> four and four, three and three. Now even, right? Yeah. And, and, um, but yeah, I mean, Anthony's first contract with 3,000 to fight and 3,000 if you win. Mm. And then if you win that one, the next is six and six, right? And that had that was even a jump up from from the previous contracts, mm -hmm. and so so you get six thousand dollars for training for two to three months, right? Most guys do like a ten yeah. week camp, right? Something like that, ten week. Eight. So you're training three months for six thousand dollars, and you don't understand the amount of time and energy and nutrition and then cutting weight like if you're not a heavyweight yeah. right cutting weight and all the sacrifices that you have to make 
to do that. Plus you're getting punched in the head. Right. And so for me, um, I always thought there, there's, I, I love jujitsu. The reason I started doing jujitsu is I love martial arts. Mm -hmm. I love jujitsu. I love the training. Um, did I feel like fighting was the, the way to, uh, represent jujitsu? Um, I was fight. I, I had, I did challenge matches in right, the school right, already, right, right. you know, <laughs> um, for me also in the earlier days when I was, you know, a blue belt, um, it was mostly during the, during the time I was a white and blue belt. I got mm -hmm. my blue belt very quick under Hickson. So I was a white belt for six months and then I got my blue belt. Um, but even during the time of a blue belt, you know, uh, I was working at nightclubs. So I got to see myself that it worked. So I didn't need to, I didn't feel like I needed to test myself mm. in, in that context because I had done it already. Like I had been in, you know, a lot of fights. Um, and so I knew like, man, this, this stuff works. I've tested it. I've tried it out and it works and it's, you know, I'm trying to think why, why I wanted to fight. I just, uh, I guess King of the cage came to New Mexico mm. and I was like, oh, I want to, it was just an opportunity, you know, and, yeah. uh, cause I, I didn't want to punch somebody in the face. I don't want to hurt them, you know, Yeah. I guess in that aspect, you know, but it was a challenge, I guess, you know, a different yeah. challenge. And then one thing lets, leads to another, right? And yeah. Then, <laughs> now you're doing it. But I think, uh, well, Greg Jackson was around too, you know, in New Mexico at the, and I was connected with him. So he was so into it and training fighters. So I think all those influences, but he wasn't like, as big as he is now, right? Like they didn't. Yeah, have oh, he was. He was in a tiny little place, like the size of this room, uh, fold out, fold out mats. You know. Yeah. Um, it was his, his thing was called Gaido Jitsu, mm -hmm. the way of the street. You know, mm. and uh, yeah, they he, he had tough guys. He trained them hard. You know, um, and believed in the sport. You know. Yeah. He really believed in the sport. I believed in jujitsu, um, but he made me like I think just because we started to connect a little bit. Um, it made me, I think step that, I think that was, it was probably his influence, you know, that made me go in, you know? Yeah. And just start to play around and yeah. Yeah. yeah he had a training system yeah. and just kind of, yeah. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have, I would have, maybe I was, it was me, mm -hmm. I guess, wanting to take that step. Oh, I'm, I'm interested because I remember King of the Cage was on the phone and I said, you know what, when are they coming? I was like, I, I'm interested in, 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 in trying it out. Mm -hmm. It was me, but then it was, yeah, I think just being around that environment, like you said with Hickson, if he would have been more into training guys, you probably would have mm -hmm. probably stepped yeah, into that and, scene. Yeah, and I think Hickson, when, because, you know, he was fighting in Japan, which was uh, under a different rule set. Right, 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 in right. The UFC, right. Um, he has a even, lot of weight on his shoulders. <laughs> well, even for him, uh, one of the things that he recognized was that the as the UFC transitioned, um, the rule set did not favor the grappler. It was, it was the, the rules and what they did gave the striker a huge advantage. Mm. So meaning the short rounds, mm. five minute rounds, right? So it in his game. last, in, in his last fights, the in pride, the first round was 10 minutes. Mm. I don't know if you remember yeah. 10 minute first yeah, round. Yeah, yeah. And then the, they had another five minute five round. Minute round. Yeah. So, with a five minute round, what happens is sometimes it takes time to be able to even get the person to the ground, right? It takes a little bit of time because you start, you, you kind of measure some distance, you start to kind of find timing and find distance. And then you, you know, you're going to do a couple clinch attempts or whatever. And you know, the guys are going to try to defend the takedown. So sometimes it takes a couple minutes mm. to get the fight to the ground. Mm. Once you get the fight to the ground, okay a lot of times in the beginning, the guy just locks on and holds on tight, right? Just grabs. And so try to stall. Yeah. What, what happens? Well, they stand the fight up, right? So if the guy on the ground doesn't want to do anything and, and this is for entertainment purposes, mm -hmm. right? Hey, this is a boring fight. The guy on the, you're on the ground, but the guy's holding you. So we're going to stand you guys back up because everyone wants to see a fight. So that you never see, in the UFC where two guys are standing up and there's no action going on, you don't see the referee say, Hey guys, man, you guys aren't really fighting. Let's put you guys on the ground. Mm. Right? So they stand you back up if nothing's going on. So you take the fight to the ground. Sometimes it takes a couple minutes. If a guy holds on, they stand you back up. If the guy can wait five minutes, even if he's in a submission, guess what? 
they stand you. So this and this, and this has happened in in right, the those. UFC where guys are mid submission, they're they're about to get submitted, or they're in an arm lock position, or getting choked, and then the bell goes off. It changes the whole fight, and then boom, it changes the whole fight. And then where do they start you back up? They don't start you back in the same position. They start you back standing. Standing. Yeah. And so that was the other thing um, that you know Hickson was very very uh, enlightened about is he was like, look the 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 rules that they have now is not how we developed and trained jiu-jitsu. We, the jiu-jitsu that we train and created was for a no time limit match to fight anyone of any size. Mm. And that's why you had Elio fighting, you know, Kimura, right? No time limit match. And because one of the big things for Hickson was, and, and jiu-jitsu itself and understanding the philosophy of jiu-jitsu is conservation of energy right how to be efficient how to conserve energy and how can the weaker guy be be able to beat a bigger stronger guy well you're if you're a smaller weaker individual if you think you're just going to go out and blitz a bigger stronger guy you're going to lose right if you fight a big str bigger stronger guy when he's full of energy and when he's not when he's fresh you're going to lose but if you can be patient if you can keep yourself safe right what happens over time is bigger and stronger guys tire. They're not as strong anymore. <laughs> right? And you take the best athletes in the world, the best fighters in the world, once they gas out, right? everything changes, right? right? You look at um, BJ Penn, mm. right? When he's fresh and when he was dominating guys, he was, look at Mike Tyson when he's fresh. Nobody wants to be in front of Mike Tyson when he's fresh. But, you know... Buster Douglas knocked him out in the 10th round, right? After he was tired. Mm -hmm. Look at Connor, right? Connor, in the first few rounds of the Mayweather fight, everyone, wow, he looked pretty sharp. Mm -hmm. He looked like he was winning the first couple rounds. But mm -hmm. when he gasses, you know, he has hands down. Look at, mm -hmm. you know, when he fought Diaz, it, he started to gas, right? And so the best fighters in the world, we know that, you know, your gas and your 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 energy is is your biggest enemy mm. and you can see that in fights all the time is once you know joe rogan is always big at mentioning oh my gosh he's got his mouth open he's breathing with his mouth open that's that's an indicator that the momentum is going to be shifting the other way because as soon as no matter how good you are no matter how good a fighter look at adolfo vera right his last fight he was like man i don't know why i got so tired that's sh he should have never got submitted by you know what happened yeah. the best fighters in the world once they get tired and so yeah. that's really what jujitsu was was created for is not these five minute bursts of go as hard as you can for five minutes and then get a minute of rest and then if you're on the ground just hold on and then the ref stands you back up so you can punch each other again it was created for there's no there's no there's no referee yeah. There's no one to stand you back up. It changes there's the whole no sport. It changes. It's a different sport altogether if you if you make those rules, right? Right. So, and, and there's no gloves. Able, right, right, So right. you can't punch as hard as you want as many times as you want because if you punch me in the head, you're going to break your hand. So a lot of people don't realize the reason that they started implementing the gloves in the UFC was not to protect the other fighter. It was guys, so many guys were getting their hands broken, broken that they yeah. couldn't continue to the right. next round right. that they started putting gloves on guys. Right. It's crazy, yeah. <laughs> Man, how long, how many years have you been training jiu-jitsu? 26 now. 26 years. Yeah, 26. What, uh, what are you most proud of out of those 26 years? What am I most proud of? Um... I, I I guess it would be that I'm still that I'm still teaching that I'm still training and teaching you know mm. um, I mean to, to commit more than half your life to to something is just you know is pretty incredible and that I'm still like super passionate about jujitsu I mean um, yeah man I, I I love that. Uh, I'm very proud to be able to share the art with others. It's it's made such a profound and deep impact on my life. Like, um, I, I'm very very happy and proud that I can share it with others because I know what it's done for me, and I know I hear constantly 
how it helps other people. And so for me, it's kind of, you know, making the world a better place through jujitsu. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's it. Um, you want to talk about the, the hidden jujitsu, like your, 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 yeah, your training? I mean, so, um, well, we, my, my website, I have a website called hidden jujitsu and, um, you know, we talked about Hickson and, and how, how, when he teaches, like it's his focus on the fundamentals, but mm. he's, there, there's a depth, there's a different level mm. to it. Right. And I was just fortunate enough to be exposed to it, even though I didn't know it at the time. Um, I didn't become aware of it until I started traveling and teaching at other schools. And I started, was like, wait, you don't do it like this? Because for me, I, just being very naive, I thought, well, I'm learning jiu-jitsu and you're learning jiu-jitsu. We're all probably learning the same thing. It probably is really similar. And um, there are just profound differences in, in the way that um, Hickson does things. And people always ask, why is Hickson, you know, Yes, absolutely. He he does do things different. Like his jujitsu is is better, right? He you see him teaching black belts how to do basics and fundamentals different than the way better than the way that they were doing it. So um, I started a website because when I started my website, what happened was Hickson was no longer teaching. He had moved back to Brazil, and I didn't know if he was going to teach anymore. He hadn't taught in quite a while. He wasn't traveling and teaching seminars. He wasn't, um, doing anything. And, um, I had been invited to do a couple seminars and, um, from guys that had from other schools and different lineages. And it really opened my eyes. I was like, wow, like how come these guys don't know this stuff? Because this is stuff that I learned as a, as a white belt or blue belt. This is the stuff that I had been taught. And so for me, the fear was, if Hickson is not teaching this stuff anymore and I'm only teaching to a small group of people, this information is going to be lost. So I started a website to be able to give people access to the, the jujitsu that I learned through Hickson um, because it's so powerful and it's so beautiful and it's so, um, it's, it's, it's like magic when it's done. That's right. what I felt like when I trained with them. It's like it was magic. It's it's like magic when it's done right, you know, with the details. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to do was be able to preserve that information to be able to share that information and be able to give other people access to the information because back in the day, we were very closed off. If you were from any other school, if you're from any other team, you were not allowed to come train with us unless Hickson invited you. You know, there were a few guys that I was able to sneak in to the academy to, to train, like some of the guys from Half's. I was really close with all the guys from Half's team, mm -hmm. you know, and so I brought quite a few of the guys there, like Dave Camarillo and and um, a couple other guys would come. Uh, and Dave always talks about the time that, you know, I brought him to train with Hickson. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a life-changing experience for him too, because at the time Dave was one of the top Americans. Right. And then, you know, Hickson did to Dave what he does to everybody, right? Just like you can't do anything to me and I'll do whatever I want to you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was really to, to be able to pass on that jujitsu and preserve, preserve that jujitsu. Um, and the other thing with, with Hickson's teaching too, is just because I was around Hickson and with Hickson so much and me and Hickson were the kind of the same size. So he would always use me as a training partner. Um, Hickson's teaching is you don't get the best out of Hickson's teaching unless you get to feel him. Like, and, and one of the reasons is, is because his English is not, English is not his first language, right? And as a teacher, your job is to basically transfer information from one person to another. And so if you can't articulate things, sometimes the message doesn't get across as clear. And so, um, when Hickson has the opportunity to put his hands on you and to do stuff with you, if you have a, ever have an opportunity to tr train with Hickson one-on-one -on -one personally and, and get to feel what he does, it's, it changes everything, but sometimes on video and, and it, it's, it's hard to understand what he's doing. So, um, that was the other thing too, is just to be able to really articulate it, what he's doing in a way that other people can understand and other people can absorb. So that's really been my focus the last few years. And so, um, all of my seminars, all of my camps, I record and uh, I have all that information, all that content available on my website, Hidden Jiu Jitsu. Awesome. And then, you know, I travel, I travel around the, the, the world now teaching seminars and doing camps. And if 
people want information for that. I'm, I'm on Facebook. Like I always post like where I'll be traveling and what I'm, you know, doing next. So that's always on my Facebook. Um, if they want to follow me there or, you know, awesome. Cool. Um, so in your Facebook or, or your website, yeah. um, well, hopefully next time you come down here, uh, you can, you can, we can, I can get you on the mat or yeah. organize some kind of seminar. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I would uh, love to teach some of those, those fundamentals, right? The, yeah. The deeper level, the absolutely. hidden jujitsu, invisible jujitsu. Yeah. And that's, you know? A, you know, everyone, everyone asked me why I call it hidden jujitsu. Um, you know, Hickson came up with the term invisible jujitsu because, um, the, the details, uh, are he says invisible you can't see them um but actually for me because i've been around it so much like a trained eye if you you have a trained eye you can see the adjustments you can see the the details and the nuances and they're they're very subtle so they're not for me that it's not so much invisible but they're hidden um they're there they're subtle adjustments and you can see them but it changes everything yeah awesome Awesome. Good stuff. Yeah. Man. Thank you for everything. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for all your contribution, all the love to all the Americans, American Jiu Jitsu. Like, you know, yeah. going, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's inspiring, you know, for, to see you, you know, go from white belt to black belt. Uh, it's like on, for me, it's like honor, loyalty, like all those things are like really important to me as a martial artist. Uh, so to see you like live that and yeah. then, you know, uh, spread that message. It's, it's very powerful of for course. me. I appreciate and, that. And, and that's the thing too, you know, I feel like, even though there was such a rivalry between schools back in the early day, I always felt in my heart, jujitsu is one big family, mm. you know, and that was the other thing for me too, in opening my gym dynamics, like starting dynamics and then starting the website is like, man, everyone in jujitsu should have, it should have, uh, the access, access to this information yeah. available. You know, they like, Man, Hickson Jiu Jitsu is is so amazing, and every time I go teach, everywhere I teach, guys are blown away. And it's 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 usually always the black belts because white belts and blue belts they just don't they 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 don't have enough knowledge to see the difference. But at the black belt to level, it, yeah. you can you can see and experience the difference. And so those guys are always like, "Wow, that's so insane!" You know, there's been. If you just Google like Henry Aiken seminar, you'll yeah. see like a bunch of write ups of it. Um, and it's not it's not my jujitsu. You know, this is this is the stuff that I just learned from Hickson. And I'm just lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to pass on to other people. But it, it for me, it's all about preserving this and passing it on to others so that they can use it in their lives. And, you know, they can grow and become better people and help others from it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me on.